those three scales of classification. And you can really see, obviously, there's a quite a range of, you know, much more detail that we can understand about uh, by the scale of this sort of mid-scale concept here relative to, say, macro groups, relative to formations. The same pattern holds. It's the underlying content that is going to be different. And so let's say from a data limited circumstance, I must be working at the macro group scale of classification. I need to be aware that there might be missing information down below uh, that, that, I'm, that I simply don't have available to me today. But you could also imagine looking at just this table, the linkage between fairly practical managed uh, uh, units that are commonly used for management and how this can scale all the way up to a global level. So that number one formation here that fell into critically endangered is our temperate grasslands. Okay? It, it matches directly what we've been dealing with in, in, from a global standpoint. So you can begin to see how this structure might be coming together, but we certainly have plenty of work to do with how do the classification units work together. Let me then touch on uh, a couple of these other facets, and this is actually utilizing a current and ongoing project where in the Western United States, so it's the Western Governors Association. All of the governors of the Western states have gotten together and essentially instructed the wildlife agencies to work together to address and identify crucial habitats across those states, recognizing the connectivity needs of wildlife, recognizing the need to take a more consistent and coherent view across the Western United States. And so we've been working through a process of actually identifying data layers that are some focus on landscape uh, aspects, unfragmented natural landscapes, landscape permeability, on the other hand, species of concern, species of economic importance, and inserted right in the middle there is ecological systems of concern. This is a very practical application of, let's say, you've gone through a red listing process, you've identified those types of concern, this is how they could, you could imagine them getting integrated in with other data layers in a priority setting process. So I'll just touch on a couple technical aspects that are coming out of this ongoing work. Change in abiotic processes. So again, our goal here, and let me just clarify our geography. The west here is really these states going to the west. This is sort of my geography of focus for the moment here. And so I have 300 or 350 or so upland and weapon types that I need to step through this process uh, fairly quickly. Okay, and so what we've begun to do here is develop some spatial models that are helping us integrate land use information. The, the focus here is, is getting at landscape fragmentation in, in terms of a driving uh, process that is, is affecting the ecological condition across multiple uh, ecosystem types. Can we create a, a, a robust spatial model that at least moves us that first step towards measurement of the status, the current status of change in abiotic process. That's what this is attempting to do. Now, what I can see and what, what our experience in this, in this landscape here is that by building a spatial model, so let me just clarify very quickly, the dark green is the relatively intact portion of the landscape. That is, the distance away from roads, the distance away from converted lands, is higher, and so relatively speaking, you would tend to encounter more natural conditions in a darker green zone. Mechanically, this is one of combining maps, overlaying this sort of a surface with the distribution of each one of those 350 types to give me a relative sense of, is this type of process distribution in a highly fragmented place or a less fragmented place? So it's an initial indication of abiotic process across its entire history. Now what I know about this is that I haven't been able to readily uh, factor in some biotic uh, alterations. Invasive species across the Intermountain Western United States are very, very severe. Okay, let me go to this next map. Right within the, the Great Basin, this is cold desert, basically throughout central Nevada, uh, neighboring Utah. And the introduction of invasive annual grasses have dramatically transformed vegetation and ecological processes across this landscape. This is some of the most severely impacted area in the United States from the standpoint of introduction of invasive grasses that have altered 
If there was a natural fire regime, they alter it. In many cases, in, in a desert environment, there was no natural fire regime, and they introduce a fire regime in, into a desert environment. And so, uh, fortunately, we are getting better and better at developing spatial models that are helping us characterize the reality of some of these biotic stressors. Uh, and so, again, it's that combination of the overlay of this sort of a model on the distribution of one of those types that's helping us capture that measurement of, of what is the proportion affected by that change in biotic process. So just to give you know, a quick sense of some of our preliminary, this is very preliminary, there's a lot of ongoing work here, and we actually haven't addressed California, which is a very big and complex place uh, when you look across the West. But this is just initially applying our criteria. Mechanically, what we've done is and what we're shooting for is to apply our spatial information available to us and then develop our whole network of ecologists within each of the states who are ultimately responsible for the overall scoring. They are the most expert on each of these types. And so what we're, what we're trying to integrate together is a process that is transparent and efficient. So we're going to utilize the spatial data to the degree that we can to characterize the range-wide perspective on each of these and then bring people together with that information to then apply their expertise where spatial data is not going to take us. And it's encouraging a lot of very useful conversations amongst people who share common ecosystems across borders but have not been speaking to each other enough uh, to get through this process. So I'm really hopeful that we're really piloting a, a pretty productive process to, to take this to a much broader scale. So finally, I just want to thank uh, IUCN, uh, the Western Governors Association supported some of this work that, that we're going through right now in the Western United States, and the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation has been uh, has supported us to now really ramp up this kind of work across the Americas. And so we're really going to over the next couple of years, we're going to be trying to engage a lot of people across this hemisphere to step our way through this process. So thank you. Muchas gracias a todos. Eh, lo que vamos a hacer ahora, lo que vamos a hacer ahora entonces es, tenemos nos quedan 45 minutos y queríamos pasar un poquito de tiempo. Eh, ustedes, eh, David mencionó en su presentación que teníamos unos eh, 20 aproximadamente casos de estudio que hemos desarrollado hasta la fecha. Y de esos casos de estudio seleccionamos unos, unos seis o siete. Aquí en esta, en esta mesita que está aquí, de, a mi lado izquierdo, hay documentación sobre las categorías y criterios de la lista roja de UICM, de ecosistemas. Hay este, una hojita de trabajo para... Eh, déjenme mostrarles eso que tengo aquí. Tenemos entonces este, una vida de trabajo que con tres idiomas oficiales de UICN. Todos estos documentos están también disponibles en el sitio web de este taller, en el, en el espacio del Congreso, eh, lo pueden encontrar en esta dirección, en el foro. Y lo que es lo, la lojita que van a ver ahí tiene esta estructura. Del lado izquierdo hay una serie de datos, y que se los muestro con más detalle, una serie de datos resumidos, extraídos de los, de los estudios de casos que hemos hecho hasta la fecha. Y lo que les pregunta es que examinen esos datos contra las categorías y criterios que están en las hojitas ahí y hagan un intento de generar la clasificación en diferentes ecosistemas. Si nos vemos esto de cerca, por ejemplo, este ejemplo, tenemos información sobre los cambios en el área de ese ecosistema en el tiempo, los cambios en su distribución geográfica medida con las dos formas de medir distribución geográfica y luego los diferentes eh, aspectos de eh, disminución de los factores bióticos y abióticos asociados. Entonces la idea es que eh, aquí hay gente que habla los diferentes idiomas, quizás agruparse según, según idioma, o si no, si quieren hacer la prueba con varios idiomas a la vez, mejor aún. Y pasar los próximos 20 minutos aproximadamente revisando esas hojitas de trabajo e intentando 
en una clasificación. Luego, aleatoriamente, escogeremos algunos de ustedes para que nos digan rápidamente qué obtuvieron y veamos si hay este, coincidencia con los análisis de los demás. Y al final cerraremos entonces con eh, las la palabras de Ed Barrow sobre la obra más futuro. Y quiero aprovechar también que ya lo han hecho otros para destacar que este trabajo no, este, este, cuatro años no hubiera sido posible sin el apoyo de la Fundación MAVA, la MAVA Foundation, que, que ofició la primera fase, y la próxima etapa de la lista roja de ecosistemas de, la, de América, que está patrocinada por la Fundación World 2021. Así que los invito, si no sé si... Ah, otra cosita, varios, aquí en esta primera, en esta área de aquí abajo, se pueden levantar algunos que ya han hecho... Eh, eh, análisis de tipo y también aquí Max Paulin, hemos eh, hay un grupo de personas con experiencia en estas, este tipo de análisis que estaremos moviéndonos por la sala apoyando y conversando con ustedes ¿está bien? Pero como un entusiasmo intermedio Pero, muy bien, bueno empecemos entonces tenemos 20 minutos o el tiempo que tome y, y si podemos hacerlo antes mejor y tenemos más tiempo para conversar así que vamos a empezar a distribuir la en francés y castellano y